Hi guys, this is Grandpa again. We're back again. We're now on chapter 16 in our book. Chapter 16 looks like this. It has an X, which is 10, it has a V, which is 5, and it has an I, which is 1. So if we count them, we have 10 plus 5 is 15, plus 1 more is 16. Chapter 16. And this chapter is called On the Road. On the Road means they are not at home, they are traveling on the road. During the next day, there was much to be done at 432 Proudfoot Avenue. There were new clothes to buy for all of them, and the old ones to pack away in mothballs. Then Mrs. Popper had to scrub and polish and straighten the whole place for she was much too good a housekeeper to leave everything at sixes and sevens while the poppers were away. To leave everything at sixes and sevens means to leave everything a mess. Mr. Greenbaum sent them their first week's pay in advance. The very first thing they did was to pay off the man that had installed the freezing plant in the basement. He had been getting rather uneasy about his money. And after all, without him, they'd never have been able to train the penguins. Next, they sent a check to the company who had been shipping the fresh fish all the way from the coast. At last, everything was done, and Mr. Popper turned the key in the house to the little, to the door of the little house. They were a little late in arriving at the railway, railway station on account of the argument with the traffic policeman. The argument was on account of the accident of the two taxi cabs. With four poppers and twelve penguins, not to mention the eight suitcases and pail of water with the live fish for the penguins' lunch, Mr. Popper found that they could not all fit into one cab, so they had to call a second one. While each of the cab drivers was eager to be the first one to get to the station and surprise the people there by opening the door of his cab and letting out six penguins, so they raced each other all the way to the train station, and in the last block they tried to pass each other, and they had an accident, and one of the fenders got torn off of a car. The traffic officer naturally was very much annoyed. The train was about to pull out of the station when they arrived. Even with both taxi drivers helping them through the gate and over the brass rails onto the rear observation platform, they just barely made it. The penguins were gasping for air. It had been decided that Mr. Popper should ride in the baggage car with the penguins to keep them from getting nervous, while Mrs. Popper and the children should ride in the, one of the Pullmans. The, the baggage car was a, a big box where they kept all of the suitcases. The Pullman car was a really nice car, and it's the one that had beds in it so people could sleep. Because of getting on at the observation end of the train, Mr. Popper had to take the birds through the whole length of the train. The observation end is at the very end of the train. It's like a little porch that they could go out and stand on to look off the end of the train. And because they... uh got on there, they had to go all the way through the entire train to get up to the front to the baggage car. It was easy enough to, to get them through the club car, even with a pail of fish to carry. When they got to the sleeping cars, however, where the porter was already making up some of the berths, there was trouble. The, the porter's ladders offered too much temptation to the penguins. There were a dozen happy orcs from a dozen ecstatic beaks. Poppers performing penguins, completely forgetting their discipline, fought to climb those ladders and get up into the upper berths of the beds. Poor Mr. Popper. One old lady screamed that she was going to get off the train, whether it was going 90 miles an hour or not. A gentleman wearing a clergyman's collar, means he was a pastor, suggested opening a window so that the penguins could jump out. Two porters tried to shoo the birds 
out of the berths. Berths means a bed that has a sliding curtain on it. Finally, the conductor and the brakeman with a lantern came to the rescue. It was quite a while before Mr. Popper got his pets safely into the baggage car. And here's a picture of those penguins climbing the ladders and getting up into those sleeping berths, beds with a curtain on them. Mrs. Popper worried a little at the start over the idea of having Janie and Bill miss ten weeks of school while they were on the road, though the children did not seem to mind. And you must remember, my love, said Mr. Popper, who had never been out of Stillwater before, in spite of his dreams of dis distant countries, that travel is actually very broadening. That means you learn a lot. From the start, the Penguins were a riotous success. Even their opening performance in Seattle went off without a hitch, probably because they had already rehearsed on a real stage. It was here that the Penguins added a little novelty number of their own to the program. They were the first thing on the stage. When they finished their regular act, the audience went wild. They clapped and stamped and roared for more of Popper's performing penguins. Janie and Bill helped their father herd the penguins off the stage so that the next act could go on. This next act was a tightrope walker named Monjour Duval. The trouble was that instead of watching him from the wings, as they should have done, the penguins got interested and walked out onto the stage to watch him even more closely. Unfortunately, at, the, at this moment, Monsieur Duval was doing a very difficult dance on the wire overhead. And here's a picture of that. He's up on the top, on the tight wire, and there's the penguins down below watching him as he's up on the tight, walking on that wire. The audience, of course, had thought that the penguins were all through, and they were very much pleased to see them return and line up with their backs to the audience and look at Monsieur Duval dancing so carefully up on that wire high above them. Well, this made everybody laugh so hard that Monsieur Duval lost his balance. Ork! said the penguins, waddling away hurriedly in order not to be underneath of him when he fell. Cleverly recovering his balance, Monsieur Duval caught the wire by the inside of his elbow and saved himself. He was very angry when he saw the poppers performing penguins opening wide their twelve red beaks as if they were laughing at him. Go away, you stupid things, he said to them in French. Ork, said the penguins, pretending not to understand, and making remarks to each other in penguin language about Monsieur Duval. And whenever they appeared, the more they interfered with the other acts on the program, the better the audience liked them. Chapter... 17 XVII 10511 15 16 17 The bird soon became so famous that whenever it was known that the popper performing penguins were to appear at any theater, the crowds would stand in line for half a mile down the street, waiting their turn to buy tickets. The other actors on the program were not always so pleased, however. Once, when they were in Minneapolis, Minneapolis? Once, when they were in Minneapolis, a celebrated lady opera singer got very much annoyed when she heard that the Popper Penguins were going to appear on the same program as her. In fact, 
she refused to go onto the stage unless the penguins were put away. So the stagehands helped Mr. and Mrs. Popper and the children get the birds off the stage and downstairs to a basement underneath the stage, while the manager guarded the stage entrance to make sure that the penguins did not get out. Down in the basement, the birds soon discovered another little flight of stairs going up, and in another minute, the audience was shrieking with laughter as the penguins' heads suddenly appeared, one by one, in the orchestra pit where the musicians were and were playing music. The musicians kept on playing, and the lady on the stage, when she saw the penguins, sang all of the louder to show how angry she was. The audience was laughing so hard that nobody could hear the words of her song. Mr. Popper, who had followed the penguins up the stairs, stopped when he saw that it led to the orchestra pit. Uh-oh, I don't think I'm supposed to go up there with the musicians, he told Mrs. Popper. Well, the penguins did, said Mrs. Popper. Papa, you'd better get them off before they start biting the pegs and strings off of those fiddles, said Bill. Oh dear, I just don't know what to do, said Mr. Popper, sitting down helplessly on the top step. Then I will catch the penguins, said Mrs. Popper, climbing up past him, with Jamie and Bill following. When they saw Mrs. Popper coming after them, the penguins felt very guilty, because they knew that they did not belong there. So they jumped up onto the stage, ran under the footlights, and hid underneath the singing lady's blue dress. That stopped the singing entirely, except for one high shrill note that had not been written into the music. The birds love the bright lights of the theater and the great laughing audiences and all the traveling. There was always something new to see. From Stillwater out to the Pacific coast, they traveled. It was a long way now to the little house at 432 Proudfoot Avenue, where the poppers had had to worry about whether their money would hold out until spring. And every week, they got another paycheck for $5,000. That was a lot of money. A lot, a lot of money. When they were not actually playing in some theater or traveling on trains between cities, their life was spent in the larger hotels. Now and then, a startled hotel keeper would object to having the birds register with them. Why, we don't even allow a lapdog into this hotel, he would say. Yes, but do you have any rule against penguins? Mr. Popper would ask. And then the housekeeper would have to admit, that there was no rule about penguins. And of course, when he saw how neat the penguins were, and how other guests came to his hotel in hope of seeing the penguins, he was very glad to have them. You might think that a large hotel would offer a great many opportunities for mischief to a lot of penguins, but they behaved very well on the whole, never doing anything worse than riding up and down too often in the elevators, and occasionally biting the brass buttons off of a bellboy's uniform. $5,000 a week may sound like a great deal of money, but yet the paupers were far from rich, because it was quite expensive to live in the grand hotels and travel about town in taxicabs. Mr. Popper often thought that the penguins could just as well have walked back and forth between the hotels and the theaters, but every one of their walks looked so much like a parade that it always tied up traffic. So Mr. Popper, who never liked to be a nuisance to anybody, always took taxicabs instead. It was expensive to have huge cakes of ice brought up to their hotel rooms to cool the penguins. The bills 
in the fine restaurants where the paupers often took their meals, were also dreadfully high. Fortunately, however, the penguins' food had stopped being an expense to them. On the road, they had to give up having tank cars of live fish shipped to them because it was so hard to get deliveries on time. So they went back to feeding the birds canned shrimp. This cost them absolutely nothing, for Mr. Popper had written a testimonial saying, Popper's performing penguins thrive on Owen's Oceanic Shrimp. They got it for free. This statement, with a picture of the 12 penguins on it, was printed in all of the leading magazines, and the Owen's Oceanic Shrimp Company gave Mr. Popper an order that was good for free cans of shrimp at any grocery store anywhere in the country. Several other companies, such as the Great Western Spinach Growers Association and the Energetic Breakfast Oats Company, also wanted him to recommend their product, too, and they offered him large sums of cash. But the penguins simply refused to eat spinach or oats, and Mr. Popper was much too honest to say that they would, even though he knew that the money would be handy. From the Pacific coast, they turned east again to cross the continent. They had time enough on this brief tour to touch only on the larger cities. After Minneapolis, they went to Milwaukee, Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, and Philadelphia. Wherever they went, their reputation went ahead of them. When early in April, they reached Boston... Huge crowds awaited them in the railway station. Up to now, it had not been too difficult to keep the penguins comfortable, but a warm spring wind was blowing across Boston Harbor, and at the hotel, Mr. Popper had to have the ice brought up to his room in thousand-pound cakes. He was glad that when the ten-week contract was almost up, and that the next week, when his birds were to appear in New York City, that it was the last show. Already, Mr. Greenbaum was writing about a, new con about a new contract. Mr. Popper was beginning to think, however, that he had better be getting back to Stillwater, for the penguins were starting to grow a little irritable. Irritable means that they we're starting to get worried and get mad a little easier. And that's the end of our chapter. Thanks again for joining me. Come back and we'll do it again. Bye.